my name is Cynthia and I teach here at Laney College and Laney College has been involved in prototyping tiny houses for I would say at least the last four or five years. So I guess we were a little ahead of the game before the game started. But we're going to have a great uh, interview with her. We're going to get to see some of the uh, carpentry that's going on here and also get a little peek inside the fab lab at the 3D printers and all the great work that's happening here. So uh, stay tuned, we're going to give you some great information and actually uh, ways and ideas that you can utilize in your own life at home. Thanks. So the carpentry department at Laney College is in a partnership with the City of Oakland to go out into the community and build low-income housing. And so we have built, oh, in the last 30 years probably about 18 different houses from duplexes to single family to even a passive house, which is extremely high efficiency. Uh, that last house was in Oakland. It sold for 400000 This house here doesn't have a heater, doesn't need a heater. There are no air leaks in this house. It's totally energy efficient. When we competed in the SMUD tiny house competition, our entry was the wedge, and uh, the wedge if you zoom in here, you can see uh, it was designed as an urban garden um, and the interior could sleep, it had two lofts, it could sleep five people if need be. Um, here's another example of a tiny house that has a kitchen and a bathroom. It is eight and a half by 14. It's one of the houses that lives in the church parking lot. And that was all constructed by students here at Laney. Award-winning too, right? You, you... Uh, the Wedge won the award. Uh, this was uh, a grant from the city. And we have built about eight different tiny houses. Over here I have, oh, a floor plan, let's say. So this was the Model M that had the kitchen and the bath. You saw the interior in that last picture. It looked something like that. And then we had the Model S, which was two feet smaller and just had a dorm room in it. And this one would hook up more to a communal um, area that had a kitchen and a bathroom. But much of the housing that we get this is the passive house, and this is what we inherited. And this is what we ended up with. And, I mean, the woman and her husband who purchased this love it. And I think they told me their uh, PG&E bill was $6 a month. Pretty low, pretty low. So I'm gonna show you another tiny house outside. We're now in the carpentry lab. One of the classes we teach is roof framing. So if you look out there, you'll see all these student projects making models of roofs on how they can be constructed. This was their final exam, and uh, so tomorrow they'll be very happy. So the Micro House is another um, prototype uh, trying to solve the problems in a smaller space than a house or a tiny house. This is 8 by 10 and if you can see here here's the loft for the bed. We have a closet, we have some storage here, we have pull out stairs uh, so you can get up to your loft. You have the kitchen bench and table to my left. The stool was made on a CNC machine in our fab lab. Um, but we tend to like to create the furniture that we use in these places. We've used um, CDX plywood, which this could be sheetrock for that matter, but it makes it stronger with the plywood. It's insulated. It has ventilation here and there, so you can get your cross ventilation and light. Obviously no power, no heat. Um, 
I would say that this is probably another option to a tough shed. It's not very big. The tough sheds have cots, folding cots, and battery-operated lighting. So they don't have a table. They don't have, they might have folding chairs. I'm not sure, to be so, honest. And what's a unit like this go for about? About 2200 Wow. So um, concise, small. Um, not a long-term housing issue, but a short-term. And then I'll show you quickly a small ADU that we're working on. Uh, so this auxiliary dwelling unit prototype that we're working on is 16 by 23, which is roughly 386 square feet. It has a kitchen and a bath and a single bedroom and a very small living room. Uh, I can take you in. Yeah, let's and take show a look you. inside. So here we are inside. I would be standing right now in the dining room. My kitchen would be here as I walked in. I would have an L-shaped kitchen, a dining table. This would be my bedroom and my closet. Over here to my left is a full bath with a tub, shower, and sink, vanity. And I suppose my TV would be mounted here and my sofa would be there and we could watch the football game. But we're roughly in an ADU and this would be what the infill is. And so two people could live in this in the backyard of a house that needed to get rebuilt. Right. Then it could become the guest house or the house for the grandmother or the adult children who have come back. Or it could be uh, an office. Let's say you're a realtor and you have no office to go to. This could be in your backyard and become your home office. And how many square feet is this unit about? Uh, 383, 16 by 23. And, and, and general cost? Um, hmm, what is the budget on this guy? Um, Obviously a little more than a tiny house. Yeah, I would say 50,000. Uh, could get you an ADU in your backyard. And you know, this is typical framing. This is 16 on center. There is no necessarily innovation going on here, but these walls could be built flat and panelized and moved in to any location versus having to crane this house into your backyard. And right now, somewhere that has fire, this is perfect because there's nothing in the way of getting this in your backyard, is there? You right. can just back the truck and park it in your backyard and have a working kitchen. You do need utilities, but this is very typical of an ADU. So uh, we feel that if you can build this, you can big, build a bigger house. And the students who've built this have built bigger homes. And again, for people watching, ADU stands for? Auxiliary dwelling unit. Uh, tiny cottages. And basically, they're tiny houses without the trailer and slightly bigger, different configurations. Uh, tiny houses tend to be eight and a half feet wide. 13 and a half feet high and up to 30 feet long. And, and, and typically they're on trailers, so it, it helps alleviate the need for a foundation or additional. It alleviates the need, but it also is the building go around right. for, because it's a mobile home. And right. mobile homes have different code requirements and that's why they're that size, so they can move on the freeway. I know in our county alone, just to put uh, get a building permit can be anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Correct. And then a foundation alone can run ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So that would be correct as yeah. well. And we're saying that for fifty, you can build this whole with the foundation. Now, if you wanted to get fancy, but I mean, we have double insulated windows here. This next semester, this will get uh, insulated, sheetrocked. Students will learn how to do both that, exterior trim, interior trim, and then the unfortunate reality is, is that this house will be taken apart and it won't become part of the housing stock because we can't move it. You, uh, you, it will be rebuilt at some point, possibly. Well, the house next to us was two-story a year ago, and now it's one story. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're really trying to teach the students different methods, both advanced and not advanced. Um, 
I can show you a model in our fab lab of part of a house. We were trying to do a house that was completely cut on a computer numerated router, much like a puzzle. Oh. And um, we were under a time frame to do that, and we couldn't do it, so we reverted back to basically this traditional framing. But there's lots of methods of framing. Uh, advanced framing, 24 on center. These all meet building requirements, so it's not a problem. So this is part of the ridge of the tiny house that we were trying to make on a CNC machine, which is this machine over here on my right. And um, it was all put together with joints, wooden joints, and no metal connectors, as is all of this furniture that you see here, the only metal connectors are the wheels. The rest of this is all made on that machine and it's all joinery that's put together. So Laney has a digital fabrication class and we're working on a certificate program to basically feed industry with new technology. Um, there's one other thing I want to show you in here. So, this house that you see up there is something called a wiki house, which is an open source uh, model that you can get online. And it's much like that piece I showed you, where the ridge is like that. But many things, whether it's furniture, lighting, these are laser cutters behind me, 3D printing in there, but for instance this entire cabinet is put together and there is, there's no metal in it. It's all look, look out Ikea. Yeah, we, you know, all, all the joints are wooden, the poles are 3D printed, the signage is made on a vinyl cutter, and this technology gives you the power to be self-sufficient. I mean, there are machines that can build machines. There are people who can build machines. This is the 3D printer room, the vinyl cutter. Um, one of the Fab City things is to have a state-of-the-art larger fab lab, perhaps here at Laney as the educational pillar, but also at different colleges, different places in the community. I, I've actually seen a fab, a place called Fab Lab in Chico, which is a maker space. I'm not sure right. if it's related. Uh, well, Sierra College also has a fab lab, and they're, they're they're all over this up at Sierra. I wanted to show you an embroidery. These are all 3D printed items that, again, you could use to design something, to develop it, to prototype it. So um, I thought what was really interesting, we were just talking about uh, the town of Paradise in Butte County and the reality of it starting to look at rebuilding. And uh, what, have, what have you found in uh, recent media or in your understanding of what's happening? Well, on Sunday in the San Francisco Chronicle, I read a, an article about rebuilding to take years after the fire. And it was very interesting to me um, because it it was really obvious how we're hung up in bureaucracy right now. And, you know, we have the insurance companies taking forever to get back to the people who are insured. We have the city saying that we have to test this land and we have to clear this land. And if you're in a hurry, then the burden will be up to you to have it cleared and tested. And, um, oh, did I mention that because we only have a septic system and we're one of the largest counties to have only septic, we now have to install a sewer system. So for anybody in, from the building angle, that means I have to wait till all the land is cleared and the public utilities come in and run sewer, water and gas before I can hook my house up to that. So you you know, from my understanding in this article, they can no longer just be on septic. And so, how long will it take uh, the utilities to put in the water, the gas, and the sewer lines? Because if the houses aren't going to be off-grid, which would mean a septic, right, or composting something or other, 
uh, they need those utilities. So what, what's, what's the deadline for that to be in? How can that be expedited? Two, how soon can the land be cleared? Uh, ASAP is what I would say because the more wind that blows, the more ashes that spread, the more toxins that get spread. Uh, and then three, how can the building department expedite uh, some of the issues? Now, some of the people, um, I'm not sure if it was in actually in Paradise, but where there was, they realized they were on uh, seismic land, and now they have to have the land tested, and they have to move their house footprint over, but then they're on the property line, so they really can't rebuild unless they rebuild something much smaller and relocate it. So the rebuilding challenges are huge. That's the situation in paradise, let's say. But the problem, as you know, is much bigger. There's teachers who can't afford teacher housing. There's uh, workers who can't afford to live and have to commute from Modesto to the Bay Area every day. People in San Francisco, I mean, everybody has high rent that they can't afford. And so how do we make more affordable housing? Uh, a lot of people have gone to the tiny house model. Uh, it's nothing new. The gypsies did it. Uh, but the gypsies were roaming, looking for a home. And we have people who know where they want to have a home and don't need to roam. And so is it that we are just going to build smaller, more affordable houses? Are we going to infill land in cities that has prior not been buildable because of zoning? It, typically you need 4,000 square feet. So if I had a 2,500 square foot lot, it was unbuildable. Can we now change zoning so that we can have smaller houses? Uh, the answer is yes, we must to that. And you know, my other answer would be please, as soon as possible, all of the above. But tiny houses on wheels are a great intermediate. I, I see them actually being the housing for the people working to rebuild Paradise. Not so, I mean, yes, they could be for the people who were uh, lost their homes. But, you know, I'm, I'm and, I, and my vision originally was that there would be auxiliary dwelling units or tiny houses that weren't on wheels that they could actually afford to build in their backyard, on their property, as a, as a granny flat or a cottage, um, and then live in that while their houses are being built. And also, uh, I recently did a story on um, Fair Oaks Echo Housing. So even the idea of uh, how they can be applied to co-housing, <coughs> excuse me, of how these uh, tiny houses could be applied to co-housing projects, but like you said, there's a lot of uh, administrative red tape and bureaucracy that has to, uh, they have to deal with in, in accordance to the zoning. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me very apparent that we have new problems and we have to come up with new solutions and, and, and possibly some of these um, administrative uh, red tapes need to be expedited or potentially changed so that we can start looking at a uh, much more practical implementation of things like tiny houses. Uh, so what what are you doing here in Oakland? Well, in Oakland, housing is obviously a problem. Uh, because Oakland is an urban city, and this is typical of urban cities, um, what's happening is the housing is becoming a high-rise, in essence. Multiple units in a high-rise, typically five stories, uh, there are companies who are building stackable housing, uh, modular housing. Like the storage like containers? Like factory, well, yes and no. Uh, long, uh, factory OS uh, is a modular builder up in uh, Mare Island. They are building 16 foot by 72 foot long apartment units that have multiple apartments in them, stacking them five stories high. They come uh, I'm going to say mostly pre-finished, and they are getting density in that way. Okay, so that, that's happening. Mass production of tiny houses is not. <coughs> I think I got a little dust coming in or something. <clears throat> Excuse me there. Okay, tiny houses are not. Looking for a cough drop if I had one, but I don't. <clears throat> I should be right, I have a little tickle at that the last minute. Um... So, 
in answer to the zoning problem, nothing is, sta is status quo. The fires are not standard issue. Uh, solving that problem is not a standard problem and cities need to move faster. So in Oakland, the uh, mayor is aware of that. I mean, I don't mean to speak for the mayor, but she certainly has housing as one of her primary concerns. Um, Oakland has just pledged itself as a fab city, and what that means is that Oakland is trying to have a circular economy where they produce and, and make use of everything that we do. So if China is not taking our recycling any longer, then Oakland's going to figure out what to do with their waste and whether we are going to make filament for a 3D printer out of a plastic bottle or we're going to make mat boards out of old paper. I don't know. But Oakland has pledged to work on the circular economy. Sacramento is also a fab city up in your region. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm working with the mayor and Fab City to address some of these issues. Uh, Laney College does or has done a lot of tiny house prototyping. Uh, we also build houses in the community for low-income people. But the width and the breadth of any educational institution cannot produce the amount of housing that's needed. Right. I mean, and that's really it. It's I mean, even driving here today, I know up in Nevada County where I live, homelessness is a big issue, and there's a group called Sierra Roots. So they're looking at the reality of potentially purchasing some property, uh, creating basic facilities, and the different kinds of options people would have for shelter. So <clears throat> it's really intriguing to see the potential uh, with the tiny house movement, but as you said, they're not easily multi. Um, fabricated on a large amount and also they are they're not necessarily inexpensive but it's it's also a great solution well i mean a, a tiny house i mean our experience of a eight by 14 tiny house without a kitchen so technically a dorm room you could do four four or five thousand dollars build it but if you had a communal kitchen and communal bathrooms that would solve that problem right uh, they also need power and water. And so probably one of the biggest challenges is um, not all tiny houses are off the grid. They could be, but if I build you an off the grid tiny house, I'm going to spend twenty five to 45000 because the PV, the photovoltaics, is 10000 right there. Composting toilets. Well, sign, sign me up for a couple right now. <laughs> right. But you, you, you understand what I'm saying? We've right. been in the competitions with SMUD, uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Uh, we built a tiny house called the Wedge um, that was 8.5 by 20. It was off the grid. Without labor, it cost us 27000 Everything was made here on campus except for the trailer and the PV was, was purchased, but I would say the average price is probably 50000 And do you have an F-250? Because that's what you need to pull one. Right. And no, if people don't have homes, they don't have trucks. Now, they can be transported, and when a city doesn't want something permanent, which is the case with Oakland and its tiny, uh, tough shed houses or tough shed villages, so, oh, Oakland's uh, doing tough shed villages. Yes, right now. Oakland has tough shed villages. There are two that I know of, and there may be three. Um, we, as a college, built four tiny houses, not tough sheds, for a homeless encampment uh, last fall, and um, and those didn't have a trailer. So do you have you have to have a fork all or a right. a big container mover to move those? The smaller mm. tiny houses that aren't don't have wheels also have to be moved, and they need to be temporarily put up. But there's that whole infrastructure of water, power, and so, and and then of course waste, right. which is the sewage. So RVs are set up for that. They you drive them and you pump them, right? You fill right. them up and you clean them out. Right. The same services could go to a parking lot and. You know, what I kind of see, like in the Paradise thing, is bring those, create a village on the Safeway parking lot. Well, they were at, at the, actually at the Walmart, I believe, up there. there right, were but I'm saying the people who are going to work there to rebuild need somewhere to stay. Right. 
And so create, you know, a temporary village where the workers can come. So nobody's having to commute these long distances right. because you're bringing in <coughs> people because there's no housing. Right. No, no matter where, you know, you're commuting. Even if it's the next town over, you're commuting. So Oakland's working with the Tough Sheds. Um, th there's a church alliance here that's working. The problem in Oakland is land. Whose land? What land? Uh, not my land. I mean, it's kind of the three right. things that come out of someone's mouth. And um, the churches have land, and they have parking lots, and they're very, you know, humanitarian in their thought process of trying to house people who are homeless. Wow. And so that will develop into something. It is in process. Again, you know, it. they've come to me, and I've built two for them. But I, two is not solving the problem. Right. And so I'm sure there are people who would support manufacturing f several tiny house models in mass production so that, I mean, didn't they say 2,000 mobile homes were being shipped to the fire zones? Yeah, and also uh, a, a, I spoke with a gentleman recently who created a, a, a shelter tent that's pretty easy to set up, and I know that he just donated a... Um, a few hundred of those also. Right. Well, that, but that's pretty rough. And if yeah. you're older, you can't take the weather. And if you have children, you can't do that. And So you know. is there any way, um, and I know, of course, with FEMA, isn't there some way or has there been a history at all with FEMA helping to look at the reality of tiny houses and funding some projects and creating a maybe a fleet of tiny houses that could be mobilized? Uh, I have not heard of any federal move and the problem that I hear is that housing, emergency housing, really isn't under any city's purview, it's federal. And unfortunately, we're not getting that support federally to to do that. I right. mean, I mean, FEMA know, still has yet to show up in paradise at this point. You know, noted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so my point is if the support isn't coming from the federal agencies or government. Cities are at their limits, so they're doing what they can, but they don't really have the funding or the power to fix the problem. You know, we're at college, we can train people to be carpenters, we full with many enrollments right now. People are looking for skilled labor, and it's going to take a while to catch up with skilled labor, I'll tell you, even without the fires demand for carpenters was high. So people are going to be coming in from out of state because they want work, right? right? What do you think they're going to live in? They're going to be bringing their RVs and their camper shells and, you know, if that's what it's needed. But these 2,000 houses, or, or what were they? I don't know if they were RVs or if they were, you know, I don't, what were they? Were they moving double wides up there? Were they trailers? I don't know. When I heard that they were sending 2,000, I thought, wow, what's that look like? Right, and who's street? sending the 2,000? Well, I thought it was like FEMA, actually, oh. you know, that emergency housing for fire victims. Now, I don't know if, right. you know, it's <clears throat> not for the homeless. It, it's right. mostly because this is an emergency. With well, I hope they're in better shape than the ones in New Orleans, which, of course, had a lot of issues with black mold and, right. you know, presented a whole other level of health risk to the community at large. Well, the issue that most people who aren't builders don't understand is that tiny houses are harder than regular houses to build because of the multifunctions that go on. The lack of air circulation, uh, uh, let's say you put a mattress on a piece of plywood for your loft. Did you know that you really need to ventilate under that mattress because your body heat will hit the plywood and condense into moisture and you'll sleep through the night, but as your bed cools in the morning, mold has now started to grow. Right. So, or, so there's really a whole science, to, I mean, besides oh, the construction piece. Oh, there's a huge science. Yeah, you're using up air. You're using up, right. you know... So how do you get, the, do you smoke? Now are you in a little tiny house and it's Jeez. freezing and the windows are closed right. and you're using up your oxygen and not only that, you're putting air in it. So tiny houses need to have mini splits, something called an air exchange, constantly moving inside and outside air. If you spend another $250, I can get you one that reclaims the heat from the air and you use it as a heater. 
but there's a whole environmental energy part that isn't being addressed. Right. So tiny houses or sheds or, I mean, weren't really designed to be habitable. So, you know, our houses that we live in are bigger. There's more oxygen. We have windows open. We have heaters. We don't necessarily have air conditioners or uh, air filtration or air circulation. But because we have as many windows and we have as much square footage, it doesn't impact us. But tiny houses, it will impact you. Oh, really interesting. I mean, the off-gassing of the OSB plywood, even though it's good formaldehyde, is still formaldehyde. Right. Any mattress you put in there, foam you put in there, it's all off-gassing into this very tight quarter. And you and your loved ones are breathing it day right. and night. Right, unless you have an envi- a known environmental sensitivity, a lot of people aren't aware of these factors, even if it comes to a fragrance someone is wearing right. when they come into the space. or like Some of the more natural products that you use, the, the, I don't say you have to make it glamorous, but the simpler, the cleaner, the purer it is, meaning in terms of healthy, uh, the better. So uh, that's what happened, I think, in New Orleans. And I think it wasn't that they were tiny, Inexpensive, maybe we cut corners and, you know, we didn't right. use formaldehyde-free paint. We just used paint with formaldehyde. Right. Um, but there's that. And, and, and I'm not negative at all. I actually see in cities and in Oakland, I see a lot of these accessory dwelling units, which are tiny houses in the backyard, where you might put your mother to live. Or I, as the mother, might move into the small cottage and let my daughter and her husband and kids live in my big house. So, so what's the current policy in Oakland if somebody has property and wanted to put a tiny house? Oakland is now approved ADUs. And so, you know, if there's a guidelines for ADUs in Oakland. The city of Berkeley has approved ADUs and more and more of that. The next step, at least in my opinion, is to allow to f- fill in these lots that are too small right. with small houses. <clears throat> they have to and be on trailers or they can actually... They, I mean, I'm saying the lot is below 4,000 square feet. Right. Uh, okay, and as long as you're happy to live in a 700 square foot house, right. it shouldn't matter. The scale is the same. Right. But we're saying these lots in the urban areas can't be used for, you know... You, the neighbor, could buy it and join it to your lot square footage, and then you could probably put another house on it. But in and of itself, freestanding, that lot is unbuildable. And so I think that Oakland's mayor is is aware of that and that the whole Fab City movement, that's one area that will be looked... Any any urban city can do this. This isn't just Oakland. But nobody has, and you talk about emergency housing, I think FEMA probably has something. I have seen what look like upside down strawberry crates and fiberglass, Hmm. kind of like an instant igloo. Right. 3D printer made, right? Well, you could 3D print houses too. I mean, there's, uh, that's already being (coughs) done. Well, it's really interesting too, because one of my friends who lives up in Megalia, right next to Paradise, uh, luckily his house didn't burn. But I went up to visit and I had mentioned, like, wow, this is amazing. It's beautiful up here, but it's so rural. What, what do you do in case of a fire? So a few months after that, he actually uh, picked up a, uh industrial spray gun for paint and proceeded to uh, hempcrete his roof and parts of his house. And amazingly enough, whether it was from the hempcrete or not, his house didn't burn. I think a lot of the understanding and science behind it was that when the am- embers landed on these surfaces with the hempcrete it was it was wasn't as responsive to an ember or spark as other materials like wood or, or stuff so not quite as heavy um, right or pr- maybe as pretty as a terracotta roof but nonetheless it, w- it seemed that it was a great right. feature to include in uh in fire preparedness for, for housing whatever product or byproduct i mean um cement board which is much more fire resistant than wood siding has fly ash, which are the ashes from producing gypsum, uh, and they've added that to concrete to make it lighter and more recyclable. Um, so it, it's the fact that it had concrete, you know, and the hemp was the binder or the fiber, so to speak, uh, because I'm pretty sure hemp burns. Um, but 
you know, whatever it is, whatever resources you have, you should look about, like I said, if, if, if that's something that can be repurposed into something usable, I mean, the problem up there is there is nothing. There is no there there. The trees burnt, the products burnt. And yes, 3D printing houses with concrete would certainly be a good alternative because of fire, because the zoning will reflect fire now. You know, it already did, but those houses were existing. So any new house, much like what happened in the Oakland Hills fire, uh, you know, much stronger fire ratings, uh, time frames for burning down. You're going to see a lot more stucco, uh, possibly steel framing. Um, it's hard to say, but there's probably no innovative challenge being put on by the city to create or to resolve those solutions. We're, we're still going back to what we know, yeah. and this issue of homelessness I, I mean, I, I mean, or, or lack of housing, whatever we, whatever group we're targeting, whether it's loss or uh, economy, we don't really have any good systems to, um, I, mean, I suppose the union and track homes could go in up there, right? They're, they're much faster than independent contractors, and that may be the case. But like I said when we started this, Rebuilding isn't even the problem. It's it's the land being cleared, cleaned, sanitized, and the infrastructure put in. So, <clears throat> which again, I, I know they're talking about just with the electric grid, just replacing the telephone poles, and it, it seems to me almost borderline insane. Going back to the old system, like why don't we consider burying power lines, knowing that we're now because of climate change, whether human-induced right. or a natural process or a relationship I would both. imagine the trees were the issue and the roots, but I don't <clears> think that's the issue at hand now. Right. Right? Because there are no trees. Right. And, there are, and the roots are, are dying or dead. And um, But if they're putting in sewer lines, they might as well be putting in phone lines. Right? Right. So, I mean, that's a no-brainer. Get it done. Well, it's really great because, I mean, as sad and catastrophic as it is, it's, it's almost an opportunity to try to uh, change the old paradigm and implement some of these new technologies, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing development, not only for the benefit of paradise, but almost as a model for the world. And that's why in some of the counties where we do this show, these resilience academies or centers of resilience education are becoming really popular. I mean, we're trying to do one in Nevada County right now so people can come and learn about alternative building they can learn about uh, green waste and everything from permaculture to water catchment they can learn about solar and wind technologies and various options for renewable energy and uh, there's a whole myriad of things even uh, water purification up in Nevada County we have over 400 miles of NID ditches from the gold rush and they're all contaminated with heavy metals that which are used as a, a algicide by the local water district and they're all contaminated with Roundup which thousands and thousands of gallons of Roundup are sprayed uh, quarterly along the irrigation ditches for uh, as an herbicide. For well, at least weeds don't grow. <laughs> yes, that's, I'm joking. that is true. <laughs> I'm joking. Nothing and nothing else does. So right. these are the, some of the things that we're um, just trying to raise awareness about. So I really appreciate you and, and everything that you're doing here, taking time to, to speak with us and to just be able to educate little uh, people a little more about tiny houses. And uh, any any words of wisdom that you would like to leave our, our viewers with today? I would say if you are a person who is energized by being creative, that figure out ways to solve the, your own problems. So if you no longer have a business, then create a factory that's rebuilt, rebuilding houses, whether they're ADUs or tiny houses, start producing something to solve the problem. Like I said, we could put ADUs in the backyard of every single house up there, right? And people would have housing to live in while their houses were being built. That is solving two problems, okay? And it's building, it's bringing people back into the city or into paradise, wherever it is, um, so I would say start these businesses. You know, I would like to see governments giving 
prizes and awards to people who could solve these problems to basically, this is about innovation. This is about thinking outside the box. This is about changing the rules. I'm not talking about bending them. I'm talking about changing them because we're changing. And being flexible and being able to turn 180 degrees fast is really important. And, and the people who did survived, you know, up there. I mean, so I, I would just say become an entrepreneur, join together, change how you think about housing, change how, what governments think about zoning. And I think together we can meet the needs of all of us if we work together.